Welcome to the Strategic Project Leader, where we help you leverage strategic project management so you can achieve your goals. Now, here's your host, Ola Alibi. Good morning and welcome to another episode on the Strategic Project Leader. My goodness, I'm always excited for Saturday mornings because it's a time where you come and get filled as a leader, as a project professional, even just as an individual contributor in the workplace. Today, it's a special one because we're going to be talking about a great topic that affects each and every professional. I love a comment that one of the leaders from Saudi Arabia did put during the week. He said, when we think about data, it's one that goes beyond just what project managers or project leaders actually need. Every individual needs to understand data. My name is Fola Alibi. I'm your host on the Strategic Project Leader Podcast and all about helping you become empowered to take on projects, to take on businesses and achieve success beyond just even your career, but also in your personal life. Today, I have a leader all the way from Switzerland. Oh goodness, I'm like, I'm super jealous because it's a place that I haven't visited yet. And he has actually promised that, goodness, he's going to be hosting me. So I'm looking forward to this. I have got someone, and let me just give a little bit, just a piece of it, but he's going to be talking a lot about his experience for over three decades. Did you hear that? Three decades. He has actually done stuff around technology and data-driven projects. He's well vast around best practices. He's actually specialized helping organizations use data and data analysis to help them get results. And what I love about that is he calls that evidence-based practices that helps align to rapidly changing business environments. He's the author, I've got my book right there, of leading projects with data. I know I made reference to that during this week as well. Can you please help me give a round of applause as I bring on stage Marcus Goes. Marcus, how are you doing today? Thank you very much, Fola. i uh, very happy to be here. I'm great and really happy to be here uh, in your show. Thank you. Fantastic. And um, how's the weather today in Switzerland? Uh, it's actually quite sunny, quite warm. So finally, we've got some summer. Uh, you know, we haven't been that... Uh, that uh, lucky over the last weeks it was rainy etc but right now yeah we're heading into summer right now finally that's right and we in canada interestingly we went from winter straight to summer we didn't actually even have spring at all and so it's definitely one that i can all complain to it's nice and sunny it's bright and we're going to be talking about the sunny data so i think it's time and i want to know everyone is actually joining me let me know where you're joining us from i'm from calgary canada and Marcus is joining us from Switzerland as well. I know we get people from all over the globe. Let's get the pulse on where you're joining us from. And remember, on the show, you are going to get a chance to ask this subject matter expert any question you have when it ties to data management and project execution. So let's get on with it. My first question to you, Marcus, is what brought you into the world of projects and data management? Yeah, that's a very good question. So um, that comes I mean, it goes to my background i mean i'm definitely a project manager for a long time already uh, so i think it's close to 15 years right now that i am in project management and uh, at some point i um, entered the banking space of financial services i worked actually for quite a while in compliance areas uh, to be more exact financial crime compliance and uh, who is familiar with those kind of areas would know that it's very data centric Right? There's a lot of data going on, a lot of technology, and uh, yeah, projects are obviously delivering um, these kind of things to uh, uh, deliver data technologies and uh, eventually also AI to compliance businesses in, those, um, uh, in, the, in that industry. Uh, and that's where I realized, right, I mean, why are we actually, or why is this actually needed data? It's mainly needed for to do proper decision making. And then I realized, okay, we are actually delivering this with projects and in project management, we do a lot of decision making every single day, right? And if you know about our project success rates, and there are a lot of debates obviously around this, uh, it's not 
really looking bright. Uh, and this where the other actually we have to go along with our business partners or our project clients to actually also be yeah in sync basically in terms of maturity uh, and and our capabilities. So while we're actually building up. Um, in my case, it was compliance areas, their capabilities with data technology, whereas project management is left behind kind of. That's how I felt. Uh, and that's where I started looking into this uh, and uh, obviously uh, leveraged also my knowledge or my experience in those data-centric uh, domains to actually yeah, bring it into projects um, uh, and uh, how to make use of it and eventually to improve our project management practices and uh, outcomes. So that was kind of the the trigger for me and, and the motivation. That's pretty great because obviously for me as well, having worked in Europe and worked within the financial services, you know, information, data is absolutely critical, right? Decisions have to be made, compliance, money is involved as well, for, you know, for our customers. And so the information has to be timely and it has to be correct. And I love the fact that you've actually tied that back, you know, around AI as well, because that's what we're talking about today. Everyone realizes that we need information even for ai to even be more effective right the right data has to be fed into the system but before we get into data i mean to artificial intelligence right i want to know for project managers who are within the space of delivery right now hmm. they already feel a little bit overwhelmed people say we need data we need information Marcus, where should a project manager really start when it comes to just sifting through, you know, you've got, you've been handed a project to run and you know that it's extremely complex. You're like, there's just so much information. How exactly should they start? Where do they start? Yeah, that's, that's the topic about data literacy that I'm actually exploring quite a bit uh, over the last years uh, for the project management space. Uh, so yeah, the short answer is, yeah, become data literate, right? And the long answer is uh, data literacy doesn't mean really like you have to actually become a data scientist or you have to start wrangling data, et cetera, because it's, it's much more than that, right? It's not um, only digitalized uh, data, it's also about you know what you exchange, you know how we uh, collaborate uh, with each other in projects, what we see, what we visualize, right? Uh, what we um, yeah perceive, right? As part of a project, and then we make judgments out of this, right? We, so we, for example, we have meetings, uh, we exchange information, we uh, seek other or peers' opinions, right? Or other people' opinions, uh, etc., and and try to make uh, sense out of this, right? Uh, so, for example, if project managers perceive a declining performance in, in their projects, then in, you know, in agile practices, for example, you can see that actually in some throughput data, right? Uh, so we can see it on charts, etc. cetera. Uh, but to understand um, why that is happening, you need actually more than that. You need to actually ask the question, um, yeah, why is this all happening? And you look for other data. And that's usually data that's not even digitized. It's more like in the people's minds, uh, you know, there's a lot of buried information. Uh, and so to answer your question, to really get started, uh, the starting point is really like collaborate more, um, you know, have these cross-functional teams, which many organizations are already um, having implemented uh, and uh, exchange knowledge, exchange information. Right, uh, because a lot of information is not really properly maintained in uh, project management. So, for example, uh, project plans. Right, I have seen ma many times how projects ran and then they uh, they're finished. Right, and we just throw it somewhere on some SharePoint. Right, which feels to me like a galaxy far, far away. That's how I call it because it's it's really somewhere where you just create a folder for a project, you put your data on there and then it's never seen again, right? Because nobody knows about this. Oh my uh, goodness, so Mark. That's like all the um, lessons learned server or something. We just put it in, a, you know, we just save it for the future. Yeah. <laughs> and and people think then really like, uh, oh, uh, you know, I have, I have put it on a project folder or wherever I've, I've saved all the stuff on SharePoint. So I'm, I'm all good. I've shared my knowledge, right? Or shared the data. No, you haven't done anything, right? You need to actively share information and data with your peers, with your colleagues, with other teams. Uh, and there are various uh, ways of doing it, right? By, you know, there are, for example, some brown bag sessions, that's what they call it, right? And some organizations where people actually uh, present their project uh, and, and what they have done 
uh, etc. And obviously also some some communities in the organization, right, where they share share information and actively sharing what's actually going on, right. Uh, so that's that's one thing, obviously, which is. Uh, uh, called eventually data democratization, right? That's that's kind of the term for it, which basically means sharing and make it accessible to everyone in an organization so pe other people can actually take learnings out of this. Obviously, this is just a, uh, a starting point, uh, but the first thing is really like make sure that you are aware of the value of your data, of your project data, everything that you're producing in a project, never throw it away. And, and never just uh, store it somewhere on some random SharePoint. Actually make it available, make it accessible uh, and, and kind of yeah, build the processes around this to make that happen. So that's kind of a starting point that I would say. Fantastic. We need to unpack that. For everyone listening, we've been talking about data management and how exactly you can start by leveraging the information that you probably have and probably the ones you actually don't even have at the, at the, at the start. So the Marcus has made it really clear to say that we need data. However, to ensure that the data that we have is actually relevant and actionable is one that we need to keep, not just put somewhere and dump it, but we need to ensure that when it comes to probably lessons learned, information from the mm. stakeholders, what the products really needs, what products have actually done in the past that you can leverage. We need to build communities of practices. We need to have like sessions where we can actually share this knowledge, where it actually then becomes power. It becomes intelligence because there's one piece for it to, be, to just be information. It moves to a stage of being knowledge when you actually have experience from it. But when you then utilize it, that's where the power and the magic actually happens because it becomes intelligence. So the thing about your starting point is gathering the information that exists, but ensuring that it's easily accessible and putting pieces in place to ensure that people can actually leverage that. So I love that. I love that really well. So I think it gets to the mindset as well. And I want us to unpack that. A lot of people feel... I don't really want to share because I may have had some lessons and some failures. A PM comes in and a lot of things may have gone wrong, wrong on the project. And they're like, how do I make this data known? And then they're going to see the whole, so know that my suppliers actually didn't, you know, bring their um, deliveries on time. We never really tracked that number. Estimates completion was off. And then I'm going to be slapped on the wrist. How can we shift from a mindset where we feel that, it is a problem to more of an opportunity where we can leverage data and make it powerful. Yeah, good, good question. And, and you kind of go right there where it, it's very painful. Uh, it's exactly uh, the problem that, you know, sharing data starts actually also with, with making aware um, what the value of data is and not only that visible data, because, you know, what we usually have, what we, see as data or project data is usually what you collect uh, by PMOs, for example, right? In terms of milestone data, or you meeting those targets and schedule, et cetera. That's, uh, that's really basic stuff when it comes to really understanding the question why certain things are happening, right? It's, it's simply not enough, right? Uh, because projects are overrunning all the time, right? And then, yeah, what usually happens is then as a project manager, goes from one meeting to another and has to explain and we have to have some post-modem, et cetera, and explain what the hell happened there, right? Uh, and, and, and why is this overrunning, et cetera, right? And uh, this is really just a, um, a culture of, or a method of, of uh, um, 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 awarding or punishment, et cetera, based on, on project results. What we want to know is why things are happening. So people have to open up to really what you just said, right? So uh, there are certain things that people don't really want to share because it throws like a, um, yeah, a shadow on their on their uh, competency kind of thing, right? So we use workarounds uh, in, in in projects. I did that for many years, right? You know, and sometimes it's not even very much in line with companies' policies, but you know, it saves the project, so we do it. Or we take some favors from from peers, right? Or we made a mistake, right? As project managers, I mean, we're just human human beings, right? So we have missed something, right? To to get triggered a certain task, yeah, uh, and so forth, right? And, and then, oh, uh, then, then I have to actually call someone. He has to do me a favor, etc. Happens all the time, right? But nobody ever is 
putting this on a project plan, uh, documenting this, this and this happened. Not to mention like like uh, saying that out loud, right? Uh, to to anyone. And this is kind of um, where it comes back to uh, project failures, right? Uh, because in in the end, we have uh, a culture. Uh, many organizations have a culture where it's just about project success or failure, right? Yes. Project success, and if you think about this, project success is a term that to date is not properly defined. There is no definition. There's not even an academic definition, a one uh, that everybody can agree on what project success means. But everybody is very quick when it comes to project failure, right? You know, just not meeting the target of, of budget or overrunning schedule. Yeah, it's a failure, right? So to start, uh, and that's what I am proposing, actually, is the term project failure. We should remove it from our vocabulary in project, in project management. It does not I exist. love that. I love that. But I want to challenge you on that, Marcus, pretty quick, because for I feel success is different depending on the organization, depending on the parameters, right? Because, for instance, if you're dealing with pharmaceuticals, for, for instance, right, a company might be running a trial med medication. For them, success will mean maybe in the next six months or 12 months, they want to be able to test and see what the outcome may be, or maybe like on humans or lab rats or whatever, because they want to get a vaccine that's going to change the world. For some other pharmaceutical company, they're just going to say our goal is to at least get something that could get people maybe 50% of the way. Just think about COVID, when COVID happened. And so I think success will be one that every organization has to define because for some other people, they just want to be the giants in the market, right? I want to be, I want to just trump Apple. It might be a new tech company saying that, how can we beat the tech giant, right? How can we become number one? It doesn't matter what happens, right? We want to get there. For some other bank, it's because how can how can we you know create better financial efficiency around how we you know economic um, empowerment? It could be different, and so success and failure is one that is really really subjective. But for me though, I believe it has to be purely defined in the business case. So when a project is kicked off, the senior leaders have to sit down and say, "What are we really looking to achieve, Marcus? Right? Is our goal you know to just increase profitability?" Is our goal to grow into new markets? Whatever that is. Or is our goal, you know, meant to become the next giant that takes the next um, whatever into the moon? Whatever that is, that needs to be clearly defined. So whoever is the PM who comes in, and if it means that we have to do that in the next 12 months, so making it a little bit more smart and measurable. So that way we can say our goal was to do this in five years. We're meant to probably do this less than a hundred billion dollars we want to be able to get you know people excited about this and that way we can track that it is clear so when i bring marcus as our consultant to say how can we get this done it's easy to say this is your performance criteria for us to judge what success really looks like but i also get the perspective where a lot of pms feel that if they show the problems the challenges on their project they seem to you know be seen as failures but it is a journey through executing and achieving excellence. And that's why I love um, the conference where I'm going for in Saudi Arabia in a couple of weeks. The team is a journey to excellence. When it comes to organizational success, when it comes to projects, it's all about that journey because there's nothing called Nevada where you feel that God, I've just reached, you know, the, the fantastic place because it's always all about agility and continuous improvement. And so I want us to dive into like data. How can we really look at it and say, Based on what we have, what are the markers that are extremely important that can already show us where problems are pretty much on the horizon? Because for PMs who see there's so much there, we know we need to gather information. But what are the key indicators that you have seen from your experience that can show uh, a problem child? What can PMs look out for throughout the project? Yeah, I mean, uh, um, yeah, I mean the, this is also very subjective, probably, but uh, I mean they're they're definitely, and what I mentioned before, right? What people usually don't open up for, right, uh, or, or share in terms of information, right? So when you have a project running, and this is all just an exercise of of uh, you know um, taking some shortcuts or some workarounds, etc. Then uh, if that's the common practice, if you realize that all your projects are running this way, right? Then uh, you probably should make a change or to to standardize certain things or at least make a change in, because something is happening which is not common or which is not best practice, so to say, right? Uh, so if you just take 
workarounds and and favors, etc., and just rely on this, right? Uh, and and this is kind of what you should identify, right? Uh, but for this, people need to open up, right? They need to actually share this and have that transparency uh, to to actually uh, say, okay, you know, my projects are. Uh, this is how it works, right? This is, this is a reality, right? And then you actually automatically you see uh, teams running at the edge, right? So when uh, I have been in environments where people were, or teams were running completely at the edge because, um, and I always compare that there's an interesting um, uh, a picture, right? Or a, a comic uh, kind of, uh, comic star kind of picture where someone is actually carrying a, uh, or, or, or pulling a carriage, right, with with some square wheels, right, and then someone comes along and actually brings the 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 real the round wheel and says, "Can I help you?" Right? No, I'm busy. Actually, I'm busy. Actually, I'm I'm fully at work here, so I have I have no time for you right now. And that's what's happening a lot of times in organizations where people just stressed, being stretched to the limit so yeah. much that they're not even doing lessons learned anymore, right? Oh yeah. Uh, and then uh, then it's just becoming an output. Uh, focused exercise. Yes, and we're not really looking anymore at the at the bigger picture and what's actually happening or what should happen, right? And if you see this, uh, then then obviously something needs to change, right? But this, as I said before, right, it requires first of all it requires proper transparency to understand what really is going on, right? Uh, in projects, we don't want to know about okay, it ran over by a week or whatever, right? Or we didn't meet the financial targets, right? Because uh, you know. Nowadays, uh, you can build all kinds of stories around this uh, and say uh, this project was a huge success story, right? Uh, and although it actually completely overran, right? Uh, in, uh, I've read about, um, what's that? Uh, Olympic Games, right? Uh, always success story, right? Never made it ever on budget. Never. Not a single one. Uh, so uh, then, of maybe course... Maybe money was never an issue, it, right? right? Maybe they had... <laughs> Maybe they had an unending port. Probably that's what we need to be right. What you just have, they just bring you in, Marcus. They say, guess what? It's a bottomless budget. Just go in yeah. and keep building. It doesn't really matter. We're going to change the world for sure. Yeah. You know, I think that's interesting because you've mentioned a couple of things and this particular theme that I can hear. We say PM should be transparent, Marcus. Yes. The reality is when project managers are actually brought in or even professionals generally, how do they influence leadership to see things differently? Because it's easy to kind of say, be transparent, right? And then a PM, you can see maybe ahead of you who actually shared the issues that they had, maybe got kicked off the project or got sacked or something, right? <laughs> how can they, so how can we create that shift where senior leadership now begin to see data as very, you know, important and not actually scold and, you know, kick people out because something that is actually perceived to be failure, you know, it's, you know, it's whatever it is. How can we start influencing? So what are those things that, what are those skill sets or how can PMs, you know, embody that? I don't know what it is. Is it, is it a superhero cape? I don't know what it is, but what exactly is it, Marcus, to actually create the shift, especially for senior leadership? Um. Yeah, I mean that that's that's probably a very tricky question, but I mean uh, obviously it comes back to data literacy. But you know tr uh, what I mean with this is really uh, first of all making this proper shift to actually using data, having a proper uh, knowledge management, so to say, right, and and share this uh, across different projects. Uh, and and this includes obviously transparency, right, uh, and then also identifying certain uh, issues that you usually don't see, right? Uh, because, you know, every, everyone is just uh, focusing on, on just getting projects across the line. But then when you start sharing information and starting with uh, sharing that with your other teams, with your peers, et cetera, right? And you come up with your truths, right? And then you, are, you real, realize, uh, you know, uh, what's happening elsewhere, and how this is happening, then you're open, obviously, to share more, right? And you start questioning. So the, the big uh, thing is really like asking why things are happening, right? I think that's that's what it comes down to. So when you start asking, why are we doing this, right? Why are we adding 20% of contingency reserve to projects, for example, right? Many do that. Like, just like uh, rule of thumb, 20%. 
right? Why are we doing this? So uh, yeah, maybe it's maybe it's valid, maybe it's uh, it's it's common practice, right? It has been established, but nowadays you cannot actually just continue just because it has been done all the time like this or forever. Uh, you have to ask things, why are things happening like this? It needs to go across the board. So when you're uh, saying also like senior management, right? They're asking and they need to also become data literate, by the way, right? It's not just like project teams, right? So anyone like project sponsors uh, up to the C-level, they all need to become data literate, which means they have to ask questions. Why are we doing this? Why are we not doing this in a different way, right? They will ask. And, and we have to ask also, right? Why are we doing things like uh, we always have done this, right? Yeah. So it comes down to critical thinking, questioning, uh, et cetera. Think about, um, uh, you know, it, it's maybe, not sure if that's a good example, but, you know, we use all chat GPT right now, right? Uh, and, and we ask questions. Yeah. And uh, we get something back, which is not useful for us maybe, right? Because why? It's not because it's a wrong answer. It's because we didn't ask the right question. So we have to actually continue asking questions. And there's this technique of the five whys, for example, uh, where you actually get to the bottom of things. And what you will, to answer your question, actually, wh what it will come down to, you actually discover things. Uh, so you will actually, along the way, you will discover you get some insights, right, which you never had before, right? Uh, you didn't see it. And insight is not really something uh, to retrieve information, uh, which just supports your message. It's something that's actually something completely different. It's something that that uh, enlightens basically your entire uh, approach to, to running a project. And that's basically the whole value that it comes down to. And if you present this and show this to senior managers, to project sponsors, et cetera, what we have discovered, you can actually build um, kind of or start building project management as a real strategic partner to uh, to your businesses because then actually you start discovering things like technology wise for example right uh, uh, what's on the radar what kind of risk we are we are facing uh, etc and that can um, uh, influence the business strategies right and I have seen this for example, in compliance areas, which, as I said, it's very data centric, very, very technology driven. And when you come up uh, with certain insights that you get from this whole technology spectrum and what's being developed, you know, we're talking AI nowadays and everything, you know, machine learning. Uh, and then if you actually leverage this and all these insights that you get from this and, and uh, transport this to to the business, right? Then uh, it will influence their strategies going forward, and that's what's happening in many uh, areas. I know that's really great, especially when you mentioned project management. Then becoming in the project space become strategic partners, and there's that direct line to see because that's kind of what we are about. How we can elevate the project management discipline, right? And for us to be able to do that, I actually call that kind of like evidence-based, like information management, because senior leaders only care about some certain things, whatever success means to them. And I love it just reading the book and just like, you know, Marcus wrote this book, very interesting. And we're going to be talking more about it. And I know you've actually alluded to a lot of the piece where the data that has to be presented has to be one that's obviously factual, right? You need to give the right data points where they know that, for instance, this project, these are the implications of what, what decision we're actually taking. The decisions we take today will have X amount of impact. But ensure that you are given the senior leadership options. So they obviously know that, okay, we have to make a decision. These are the data points that what we've actually gathered so far. These are the implications of the risk. These are the actual, this, this is what the cost is going to be. And let them make the decision. It's not a case of um, this, uh, this is, um, these are all the problems, but that's fine. Even before they become problems, I think there's, there's a piece where PMs or professionals generally are really not proactive because of the fact that they kind of feel that if I kind of sh highlight this particular issue right now, yeah. I may be seen as well, I'm not doing something great. So I think a key takeaway as well, what I've also got from what you've been saying is let us be proactive in presenting this information, this data. That's one. So even before it becomes one that's catastrophic, senior leaders are already aware of what's happening and give them options, right? That way they can actually say, guess what? We had a $5 billion project. We were told six months ago that this was probably on the horizon. If we take option one, it's going to cost us an extra $1 billion. If we take option two, 
we may actually lose our social license to operate. If we take the option three, it might mean that we deliver the projects, you know, maybe three years later, whatever that is. So that way, this is a tool that you can show up and say, even if things do go wrong, you already are ahead of the information to say, we've highlighted this because no one has the magic ball, the crystal ball, right? To tell the future. And so I love the fact that data gives us evidence, gives us past information, gives us what the future kind of looks like to say, guess what C-suite? This, from what we've actually read, from what we've actually seen, from what the indicators actually um, shows today, it means we're heading for something not so great. Because people or PMs actually wait for things to go wrong and then it becomes an issue. You see what I mean? Because project managers are not meant to be, you know, putting out fires. We're meant to be trying to see things. And when it comes, when it seems like something is coming off, we can proactively sit back and say, guess what? This is on the horizon. How can we ensure that we prevent it? This ties into my next question. We know we've talked about data literacy. How exactly do we manage things when things are rapidly changing? Because data is coming in, we talk about change management, right? Mm -hmm. As project managers or as professionals, how have you been able to manage rapidly changing environment and rapidly changing information? What have you used? What skill set have you leveraged? Yeah, that's a very, that's a very good question. And, and uh, you're absolutely right uh, that, you know, um, decisions need to be taken much faster than ever before because things are changing much faster, right? We know this. We know this, you know, with the pandemics, that's a perfect example, right? Out of a sudden, things are changing. But if you if you look closer to actually this uh, kind of event, right, uh, you know, many organizations, they were not prepared to actually change everything from one day to another. So uh, they just went bankrupt or anything, right, uh, and, and struggled to, to survive at least. Uh, and then other organizations, uh, mainly the bigger ones, uh, they they just you know they 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 send like a workforce uh, of I don't know how many thousands of people home right from one day to another, overloading the the company's infrastructure uh, and okay uh, balancing a little bit and it, it takes maybe a few days and everything was settled right and everything was uh, going almost as normal uh, just going forward they were prepared right uh, so they had that on the radar. Right, they didn't know that this is coming, but they were uh, they had the bigger picture in mind, and they were actually aware of certain risks, right? Which usually we don't see, uh, at least not as clear as as we should, right? And um, so before even and so in projects, we're obviously also facing more and more these kind of situations where change comes in, and we have to. Uh, yeah, take a different direction, right? And then people say, yeah, we have these agile approaches. Yeah, oh, great, right? We have agile, which make, makes us capable to change direction, right? Yes. But the question, the next question is, which direction? Which direction are you going, right? Uh, you have to actually, usually then, first of all, we get a change request or something, right? Which sounds overly administrative. And then you get something in and then analyze this and let's uh, collect information. And then I don't know how much time later uh, we come up as, okay, uh, we have done a replanning, right? And go through the next uh, steering committee uh, meetings, et cetera, to present this and to get this approved and so forth, right? Which obviously takes a lot of time, right? Uh, and so, more often, we face these situations where we just need to instantly almost, um, yeah, we change and just redirect this whole thing. So to answer your question, how to, how to get there, right? I don't, I mean, data is obviously one thing, right? Uh, but data is also its limitations, right? And data and analytics and so forth, right? Be because first of all, you need to actually collect the data. You need to actually, you have to do some analysis, uh, which... Uh, takes uh, or can go much faster than before, of course, uh, with the proper tools. But before we even go that route, I suggest actually first actually leverage the data that we have already. As I mentioned at the beginning, we have a lot of information. We have data in, in our heads and with our colleagues, with our peers, right? Uh, and for example, pre-mortem exercises, they're really, really helpful, right? Uh, and if you're not familiar with this, it's kind of the same as postmodern, just you do it actually before the project. Uh, so when the project starts, you're kind of imagining things. Uh, you're just saying your project failed, and then you kind of uh, uh, backwards, you actually uh, analyze um, what could have made that fail. And you come up with a wall risk lock 
uh, that you would be amazed what's coming out there, right? Obviously, you should take a broader um, audience there, you know, with other teams or business people, IT people, etc., and and uh, do some brainstorming on this, right? And they come up with uh, extreme stuff, right? Uh, and then you prioritize this and you have a risk log that you, maybe you, before half of that would have been missing if you wouldn't have done that, right? Uh, the other thing is you have to create diversity in your teams, right? You know, uh, I always say, uh, uh, um, you know, when people say, uh, yeah, we are hiring you for cultural fit, right? Uh, and then you hire people and that's this is nonsense, right? In my view, right? Uh, cultural fit often means actually, yeah, we hire them uh, because they're actually sharing the same views, right? They have the same ideas. So there's no difference. There's no diversity whatsoever. Uh, so they're just fitting in, right? In, in, this, uh, in this world construct, which is not really useful, right? So you should actually, um, and I think, uh, I believe, you know, Steve Jobs uh, used to do that, right? He just did hire people who actually had a completely crazy view and completely different uh, uh, and just to challenge each other. And to come up with new ideas, right? Uh, and but then the next thing is you actually have to accept this, and that comes down to to culture. Because when we uh, talk to people, and that's uh, that's proven, right? When we talk to people, and and uh, they have a different opinion as we have, right? Then uh, we don't like them. <laughs> we literally don't like them, right? Of course, we are friendly. Okay, you have a different different view. You have a different opinion but we don't like them. So what are we doing? We actually are very busy proving them wrong and that we are right. Oh Instead of actually thinking, thinking, right? Uh, maybe that person is actually right. Uh, let's actually explore this, right? No, we're actually busy proving them wrong. So this is actually what uh, a very, very human habit, uh, which uh, yeah, is something that we need to overcome, right? Or at least need to be aware of uh, but the first thing is obviously really to, to create some diversity of opinions and have some crazy views, right? I had some people in my team back then, I remember, uh, who were labeled as uh, troublemakers. And, uh, uh, yeah, we have to get rid of them. Uh, people said, no, no, we actually need those people, right? Diversity. Let them, actually, yeah. let them actually speak up and say what they have to say. And they, they're all negative. They say everything is 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 rubbish here, everything goes wrong, right? Uh, your plans are just uh, for the toilet, etc. And they come up with all that kind of stuff. And then, you, uh, okay, tell me more about this, right? You will be amazed what's coming out there. And this is actually what we need to actually get some, a broader view, a broader picture of things. Uh, and you will be more aware, you will be become more resilient, uh, more, yeah, more aware of the, of the wider picture. And that comes from within. You don't even need data for this, right? But then, of course, with this, you generate data, you put this on your radar, you put this on your risk log, you're, ge you're actually generating data with this approach, you're creating it, and then you document that properly, and it goes into this whole ecosystem of, 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 of data, uh, which will be useful for the future to actually make sense out of this with data analytics and so forth and AI eventually, you have that then. But first you need to create it. Now in project management, we actually, we are the data producers and as well as the data consumers. So whatever we produce, if we produce garbage, you get garbage back. That's what it is, right? So you have to actually start looking at creating genuine, good data, right? And that comes actually from, from our thinking, from our exercises like this, what I just mentioned, and from diverse, diverse views, the whole brainstorming, all this kind of stuff. So this would be a, a very good approach actually to, to get started. And obviously uh, there are numerous other things, but uh, there's some there's some stuff written in the book, uh, but I could go on for the next hours, I think. Uh, you know, as a pro, and I just think it's like, it's a perfect time for Project Lifestyle. We are talking about data management and I think about how can we leverage this even in our personal life? How does this transcend beyond just that project delivery? on living on time, on budget and schedule. But I think it's very important, first of all, for us to think about data. People say data, is this just numbers? But when you think about data in different shapes, forms and sizes, first, be it in business, be it in personal life, data, you think about numbers. So one, numeric data. Numeric data is all about the numerical values that you can actually, can actually be discrete, continuous data, 
But some is more information like numbers. It shows you that. Also, there are also data that can actually be grouped together because Remember, what we're trying to do is we want to be able to make better decisions. We want to be able to make informed decisions as well. And so you're going to have to gather probably numeric data, also, also something I actually call categorical data. That's where you have some qualitative piece, some nominal variables as well. You can actually group them based on themes, based on data sets. So for instance, you want to... Um, you want to build a home and you feel that the next couple of years, I want to be able to uh, have saved up $2 million to build a house on the, the, the waterfront side, probably in your own neighborhood. What exactly does that mean? I need to probably get numeric data. How much do I need? What are the things that I put I need to group together? That's it's now a category. You build it up together. And there's another piece about contextual data. I love the fact that Marcus spoke about there's some information you get even from conversations, not really about the numbers. Where you understand, okay, where is the market going? You know, what exactly are business leaders and thought leaders saying about the particular concept? Even when we talk about the property market, for instance, so we bring it really home so you can understand that. What, ex what are the contextual data that I can get from the news? What are the contextual data I can get from conversations, from social media, from customer reviews? That gives a bit of context around the data and the data set that we want to gather. And also, what about the one that has the time serial data? This is the one that has like some time information tied to it. So you could have information that was only relevant maybe like 10 years ago. So there's a timestamp relevant that ties to that information because although it was information that was out there, it may not be relevant anymore. So on the side, like I said, those are like different types of multidimensional type of data that you can leverage be it in, um, in your projects at work or at home. It helps you put it all together to make informed decision. And then I know we talk about metadata, but let's not go into that to pretty detail because that's really technical. But the key for me today is to take away the fact that when you're collecting information and collecting data, it's not just about the numbers. It's about the context. Even from conversation, you can gather information that's data. It's about stuff that's maybe time related. It could be stuff that's tied into like just ordinary information where you just things that people say you just don't actually agree on, you can group them so we can make better decisions. I want to come back to you, Marcus, now. We've been talking about data. We've spoken about the literacy part of it. We've spoken about influencing our leaders around that as well. We've spoken about how we can also think about data even in our personal life as well. What would you say is your number one takeaway that everyone listening today needs to think about an action when it comes to data literacy? Yeah, um, questioning more, right? You have to just ask. And when I say questioning more, it's not really just like looking at data and, and or, you know, we are all, or most of us probably uh, exposed to chat GPT, right? And, and we are kind of asking things, right? Uh, uh, asking questions and then asking more, et cetera. But that's one thing, right? Uh, to ask data as well, right? But we also have to ask ourselves, right? What are we doing? Are we doing the right thing? Are we as I said before, right? Like, for example, estimating things, right? I mean, is that still valid? How we estimate task and project? Is that, um, is that actually valid? Do we have to change it somehow, right? That's one thing. And uh, there are techniques, like you have to ask the five whys. Why are we doing this, right? Is there a different way of doing this? Or is there a more appropriate way of doing this? And in project management, you will find a lot uh, of situations where you actually should start uh, asking questions. So I said some techniques that go back actually to 1950s or so. So it's, it's, it's quite something. But then the other thing um, I would say, and uh, this is uh, something that I often say, you know, because when, when you talk about becoming data-driven, right, and project management, we're all looking to AI right now. Everybody's keen to get into this, right? Uh, and then you obviously need to actually trigger this, right? Uh, or senior managers need to trigger these kind of initiatives. It all labeled as a big transformation or a big fundamental change or something like this, right? No, re remove all this, right? Uh, this kind of terminology, because uh, it's it it feels like completely overwhelming. It feels like it's two year exercise which takes forever, right? Uh, while actually the journey, just taking this path, becoming data literate, right, is already uh, well worth doing it, and it. it provides already benefits because when we start looking at data, when we're looking at information, 
So like Excel sheets, or we use Power BI on these kind of tools, or any other sort of uh, you know exchange information, as you said, with conversations, etc. Right, and, and capture data and and uh, do these kind of pre-mortem exercises, for example. Everything that generates kind of data. The more we are exposed to this or look at information, right? The more we build up our intuition, we actually uh, are developing our intuition, and we become or we uh, actually build up our our judgment skills, right? We become more decisive in the end. Uh, it's like playing chess. That's what I'm always comparing it to, right? When I learn chess, right? Then I know the basic rules, great, right? But you will not be a real good chess player. You will be only become really good when you're exposed to uh, hundreds and thousands of different moves uh, or uh, how many exist there uh, and, and learn all the time. So it's all about learning yeah. and questioning and being creative, right? And And being diverse, right? These kind of things, I believe, are, are most central to this. I think overall, it's, it's it's a lot of drivers around change and learning and continuous improvement, just embracing agility and be open-minded to that. I think it's a perfect time to... It's question time. So as I said, it's time to ask a question. Marcus is actually on the hot seat right now. Let me let us know the questions you want to get answered I've got a question already that came earlier on, but there's time for you to put your comments right to get Marcus answering your question. How is AI going to transform the world of data management? The world of data management? Yes. Um, well, it will be, um, I mean, I, I suppose it's all linked to project management as well, right? But in terms of data management, uh, yeah, we, need, we will be more... Um, precise, I suppose, right? Uh, because uh, as I said before, we haven't been really good with, with data or project data to manage project data. Uh, a lot of stuff is uh, either it's thrown away or it's incomplete, right? Uh, you know, there are things like where we're just wrapping up a project. So who cares about the project plan? It's already, it's already in the final stages, so it's all good. So we don't even capture the proper data anymore or lessons learned is skipped, as I mentioned before. Uh, so all this um, will be become much better because you know it's it's all fuel for AI. AI cannot operate properly if you just provide just incomplete data, right, uh, or, or or low quality data. So the better your data is, uh, the better the outcome will be from AI, right? As I said, garbage in, garbage out. That's the principle. So this will be more focused on, right, uh, and. Uh, many say, actually, yeah, we don't have actually data available uh, in project management, so we actually have to create it, right? Uh, uh, and then we actually, in a year from now, maybe we can actually m take benefit from it, right? But that's wrong. We have the data. We're just not good at managing the data or handling the data, right? And that's kind of what goes into data awareness of data culture, or whatever you want to label it under. Uh, but that's kind of uh, what will change because otherwise AI will become useless. There's another question coming in. We just, this is our paraphrase from Robin. Thank you so much for joining us, Robin Thomas. She's talking about providing a healthy growth mindset culture should be a priority when it comes to driving data. How exactly can project managers drive a healthy growth mindset culture to actually drive data management or data literacy, if you say it that way? Yeah, it comes to transparency, right? Because uh, first of all, you need to, I mean, transparency is not like uh, asking you, you have to sh just share your information and just uh, speak up with everything for somebody else, like benefiting from it or the organization becomes more, comes better uh, with, with its outcomes. You actually, you yourself, you're benefiting from it. As I said, we are producing data and we're also consuming it, right? So, uh, uh, and on, on top of it, right, the more data we look at, we're actually building our own skills, right, our own intuition. Uh, and it, it, uh, I mean, we're actually growing with this. Uh, so, um, yeah, to answer the question, it is, it is really, uh, yeah, uh, to be, yeah, more aware of, of information that's within us, right? And, uh, yeah, obviously it needs some support from the organization to support this, but we should actually start doing this also within with our peers, right? To actually share more, to be more open, right? And asking questions and actively listen, right? To other people, right? So if you're a project leader, 
So you have a team maybe, then you actually should listen to your team closely and ask also questions so they open up. And you have to actually start uh, yeah, going upfront as an example, which means also to admit failures, right? I have done a mistake, right? I've, I've met a lot of leaders who actually um, so, uh, think like, oh, uh, we cannot actually fail. If I show up, I have made a mistake or something, then then people will not uh, respect me anymore. What a nonsense, right? Uh, everybody is, uh, is, is full of failures. Uh, we are just human beings. We just have to admit it. And so you have to create this culture by actually um, going up front as an example, admitting failures, etc. And people actually, uh, yeah, I mean, there are many other things uh, along this, about this failure um, culture. But then the goal is obviously that people open up and be more transparent about what they, um, what their motivation is, what they're looking at, right? Uh, and what they see in terms of how things should go or not, right? And, and how right. they actually operate things, things like this. Definitely. I know mean, it's, it's, it comes back to the mindset and the culture. I think there's a lot of work that we have to do as leaders, project managers, as analysts, it doesn't matter where you are, where we need senior leaders to begin to see not failures, but more about lessons, how we can learn from it so we don't make those mistakes anymore. There's another question, Marcus. Are you ready for it? So brace yourself. It's pretty easy. So we have another one from... Um, Majid, I hope I got that right. What is the best practices for data collections in organizations to have good data can be utilized in the future? So talk about best practice for collecting data so we can actually utilize it better in the future. Okay, yes. So how can we collect data effectively so we can utilize it better in the future? Yeah, I mean... Um best practices that's a, that's a broad word right every organization has a different uh, way oh, yeah. of doing it right i'm not sure if there's really a best practice uh, established right uh, but in terms of data collection uh, because we have to be aware that data is not uh, always uh, factual right it's you know when you touch data it doesn't automatically mean it's a fact right i mean we see that with uh, fake news, et cetera, right? You can come up with all kinds of stuff and it's not relevant data. So it needs to go through the proper process of, of curation, right? Uh, and that's where at least in project management, how I see it, uh, I'm not sure if that's the best practice, but I see like a PMO, for example, is kind of in the, in the driver's seat uh, to actually centralize or standardize uh, kind of uh, like data repositories around project data uh, and also yeah build some curation about some process to actually curate data right uh, so that becomes not only data because data needs to go to information and needs to become knowledge right so it needs to be actually curated in a way uh, that is really proven knowledge and that's ultimately what it comes down to. Uh, but in terms of process, there, there are many different ways of doing it, right? Um, I'm not sure if there's a best practice, but what I have seen is actually the PMO takes an, uh, takes a lead in some organizations that I have worked with uh, yeah, to, to actually run it through some these kind of uh, steps, basically, and, and, and have some um, yeah, repository and some data quality programs around this. I think that's a good point. When it comes to collecting data, it's it's different from different organizations. But I think the key again it comes back to the the mindset of just knowing that information that could affect another project just needs to be shared. And I love the fact that Marcus, you said, is beyond just storing it. It's about the community of price, about what we do with it, and it becomes ingrained in the culture where PMs are constantly sharing, analysts are course constantly sharing and you know documenting that it then becomes like a lifestyle. I love the word lifestyle. So it's not a case of now I have to just write this down at the end of we sit in a meeting and then we have snacks at the end and we do our lessons learned and then we close the project and that's it. Part of product close claim closure process. But throughout the life circle of the project, everyone is constantly sharing. They say guess what? It was an IT product. I found this bug and this kind of how I fixed it. It's captured. We shared it across the group. We shared it across the organization. And it then becomes ingrained in how we do and how we work as well. Oh, my goodness. I want to just say thank you. It's just been awesome. It's been great. We already see some fantastic response already saying that you've been awesome so far. Marcus, how can I thank you? I cannot thank you enough for being here today. We definitely need to come back. But I want people to know, especially for those who haven't seen his book, Marcus is the author of Leading Projects with Data. 
But before I even get into this, can you tell us a little bit, just a quick summary about this book and how people can actually find you? Um, yeah, I mean, this book is it's not a technical book uh, to start with, right? Uh, because I believe it's before we actually go into technical details, uh, it's really about behaviors. Uh, and, and as you said uh, multiple times, right, it's about a mindset. So we actually have to change uh, our behaviors, how we operate with data, how we actually leverage data, how we provide information, et cetera. And this is basically what this book is about, right? Uh, and, and yeah, how to find me. Uh, I have a website, uh, marcusglovas.com. Um, and yeah, my book is on Amazon if you're interested. And uh, yeah, uh, and if you're interested, obviously, to, uh, yeah, to continue the discussion or conversation, I'm also on LinkedIn, easy to find. I think I have a very unique name. And uh, yeah, so feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. That's right. And I want you to know for everyone who has actually joined and listened to this podcast, Marcos has actually given us a very, very wonderful white paper that you can actually read. But the only way you can get it, you need to put a comment below so we know that you've actually been here. And there's going to be a link where you can click on and download this wonderful he took time it's about navigating today's uncertainty and complexity with data and agility you do not want to miss this thank you so much and to everyone who actually joined us goodness from um hilkan k cool kate robin mohammed helen from calgary we have you from egypt orlando calgary my oh, goodness i want to just say thank you so much for being here it's always great to spend my time with you. You just make it what my while. Beyond everything, as I always make it really clear, is that you are your life's project manager. And the only way you can actually be beneficial is for you to make your life's project count. And what does that mean? You take action every day from what you've actually learned beyond just coming and listening. Let us make it actionable. Let us make it intelligence because when you take action, the information you've gotten becomes knowledge and then it becomes intelligence. Let's action the steps around data management on our projects, in our personal life. Let us create something. Let's create communities. Let's empower ourselves and then we can actually empower others. Oh my goodness. I want to say thank you, thank you, thank you. But most importantly, I want to know one action. What action are you going to be taking away from this? What are you going to be doing differently? What are you going to be adapting? What are you going to be leveraging? One in the comments. And I know that myself and Marcus will be more than happy to roll this and celebrate all of your successes as well. But do not forget, same time next week, we're going to be live on air talking about all things and how to make you become a strategic project leader beyond data, beyond processes, but making you the best version of yourself. Have yourself a wonderful weekend. Bye-bye. <laughs>